Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much. We apologize for our tardiness, but bills have to move on the floor to end up in the right place at the right time on the last day of the session. So we got our mission accomplished. With that, I will call the committee back out of recess, Joint Assembly Ways and Means and Senate Finance. Uh, welcome to joint meeting at dusk. So with that, we have the K-12 budget tonight, the thing we've all been waiting for with bated breath. So we will ask staff to go ahead and pass out the documents. I'm going to give everyone a moment to take a quick look. We have our marvelous, awesome education team in the conference room. Thank you all for everything you've done. We've got Ms. Kaufman and Mr. Thorley at the desk. They're running blocked tonight. As stated earlier this morning, the Committee on Ways and Means um, reviews this and then refers it over. We are review reviewing this as a draft so that any uh, concerns, if there are any concerns, can be addressed because these are not the types of bills you want to amend. We'll do a walkthrough of the bill. We'll have questions and answers. Then after the joint meeting adjourns, uh, Senate will be going to floor, and they will take the next steps to make sure that this bill gets processed in a timely fashion. We're letting everyone get copies. The staff will be doing autographs for you after the meeting ends. Give everyone a chance to take a quick look. And with that, uh, Mr. Drost, are you leading us off this evening? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Adam Drost with LCB Fiscal Analysis Division. Uh, tonight I'll be joined by my colleagues, uh, Julie Waller and J. Marie Mangoba, and we will walk through BDR 341169 that will become the K-12 Education Funding Bill for the 2021-23 biennium. Uh, Madam Chair, we will cover each section and then answer any questions at the end of uh, covering those sections. So starting with section one of the BDR, this provides the total public support for school districts, charter schools, and university schools for profoundly gifted pupils that is calculated at $10,204 on a per pupil basis in FY 2022. This reflects total funding of $4.95 billion. And I would note that these amounts include all state K-12 funding, including pupil-centered funding, plan uh, funding for the, both the base and the weights and any remaining categorical programs. It also includes federal funding provided through the Department of Education. However, it does not include federal funding provided directly to school districts. I would also note this does not include any one-time federal funding provided to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Section two provides the total public support on a per pupil basis of $10,290 in fiscal year 2023. And this reflects total funding of $5 billion. And this was calculated in the same manner as the FY 2022 amount. Moving to section three of the BDR, General fund appropriations in subsection one, general fund appropriations for the pupil centered funding plan account total $1.4 billion in fiscal year 2022 and $1.2 billion in fiscal year 2023. I would note there was no requirement regarding how the governor initially implemented the pupil centered funding plan. And this reduction reflects the governor and the money committees approving the use of the Nevada plan funding formula to determine initial funding to implement the people centered funding plan in the 2021-23 biennium. As a reminder, under the Nevada plan formula funding, general fund provide the last dollar funding based on other revenue provided through the plan. And therefore general fund appropriations were reduced 
based on increases to other non-general fund revenue. I would note this is a one-time decision uh, to implement the People's Centered Funding Plan. Subsection two provides the leg legislative declaration that the amount appropriate is sufficient to fund the operation of K-12 education. Subsections three and four are standard language requiring the general fund appropriations to be subject to the requirements of the State Budget Act. Moving on to section four, subsection one provides authorizations of $3 billion in fiscal year 2022. Subsection two provides authorizations of $3.2 billion in fiscal year 2023. These amounts reflect the funding provided by non-general fund sources, including property tax, local school support tax, governmental services tax, and room tax revenue. Subsection three is standard language requiring the authorizations to be subject to the requirements of the State Budget Act. Would note total amount of funding provided in sections three and four, total $4.4 billion in fiscal year 22 and $4.5 billion in fiscal year 2023 in the People Centered Funding Plan account. Moving on to section five, this begins funding the Pupil Centered Funding Plan in fiscal year 2022 based on the funding waterfall or tiers established in NRS 3-7-1214. Subsection one provides the transfer of funding for food services totaling $2.2 million and transportation costs of $199.1 million for each school district. Subsection two provides the transfers of local funding for special education costs for each school district and all charter schools, totaling $442.1 million in fiscal year 2022. Subsection three provides the statewide base per pupil funding of $6,980 per pupil in fiscal year 2022, which reflects the proportional reduction between base and weights needed to balance the funding model. Subsection four provides the adjusted base per pupil funding amount in fiscal year 2022 for each school district. I would note amounts include the base per pupil funding, as well as the Nevada cost of education index and attendance area adjustments for each school district on the pupil centered funding plan, or the calculated per pupil amount for those school districts on hold harmless. Moving to subsection five, provides the statewide base per pupil funding amount of $6,980 that is provided to pupils enrolled full-time in a program of distance education in fiscal year 2022. Subsection five also provides the individual adjusted base per pupil amounts that would be provided to charter schools and university schools for profoundly gifted pupils operating in each county. And these amounts exclude the attendance area adjustments. Subsection six provides the final adjusted base per pupil funding that would be provided to each charter school currently operating in the six counties that have charter schools, inclusive of the attendance area adjustments for those charter schools. As illustrated, these amounts vary based on the adjusted base amount, as well as the attendance area adjustments calculated for each area. Subsection seven uh, provides the calculated weights for English learners of 0 0.24, at-risk pupils of 0 0.03, and gifted and talented pupils of 0 0.12. As a reminder, these amounts are largely calculated based on the money committee's decision to restore and utilize funding for English learners and at-risk pupils at the FY 2020 funding levels. Subsection eight provides the weighted funding that would be provided to individual school districts, charter schools combined, and the university schools for profoundly gifted pupils in fiscal year 2022. These amounts include the calculated amounts for those school districts that would be on the pupil-centered funding plan or the amounts awarded in a fiscal year 2020 for those school districts on hold harmless. Subsection nine, details the school districts that would be on hold harmless under the People Centered Funding Plan in fiscal year 2022. And this includes Carson City, Douglas, Elko, Esmeralda, Eureka, Humboldt, Lincoln, Pershing, and Story Counties. 
This further clarifies that these school districts may reapportion base and weight funding to provide a reasonably equal educational opportunity for its pupils, which is consistent with legislative intent specified in NRS 3D 7.121. Moving to section six, section six is similar to section five and begins the funding for the pupil centered funding plan in fiscal year 2023. Again, based on the funding waterfall or tiers established in chapter 387 of NRS. So subsection one of section six provides the transfer of funding for food services totaling $2.2 million and transportation costs totaling $199.3 million for each school district. Subsection two provides the local funding for special education costs for each school district and all charter schools, totaling $442.4 million in fiscal year 2023. Subsection three provides the statewide base per pupil funding of $7,074 in fiscal year 2023, which again reflects the proportional reduction between base and weights needed to balance the model. Subsection four provides the adjusted base per pupil funding amount in fiscal year 2023 for each school district. These amounts include the base per pupil funding, as well as the Nevada cost of education index and attendance area adjustments for each school district on the pupil centered funding plan or the calculated per pupil amount for those school districts on hold harmless. Subsection five provides the statewide base per pupil funding amount of $7,074 that is provided to pupils enrolled full time in a program of distance education in fiscal year 2023. As a reminder, virtual charter schools only receive the statewide base per pupil funding amount per NRS 387-1214. Subsection five also provides the individual adjusted base per pupil amounts that would be provided to charter schools and university schools operating in each county excluding the attendance area adjustments. Subsection six provides the final adjusted base per pupil funding that would be provided for each charter school currently operating in the six counties that have charter schools, inclusive of the attendance area adjustments for those charter schools. As illustrated, these amounts vary based on the adjusted base amount, as well as the attendance area adjustments calculated for each area. Subsection seven provides the calculated weights for English learners of 0 0.23, at-risk pupils of 0 0.03, and gifted and talented pupils of 0 0.12. And again, that uh, calculation is based on the money committee's decision to base funding on the English learners uh, funding that and at-risk funding that was provided in at the FY 2020 amount. Subsection eight provides the weighted funding that would be provided in fiscal year 2023 to individual school districts, charter schools combined, and university schools for profoundly gifted pupils. These amounts include the calculated amounts for those school districts that would be on the pupil-centered funding plan or the amounts awarded in fiscal year 2020 for those school districts on hold harmless. Subsection nine details the school districts that would be on hold harmless under the pupil centered funding plan in fiscal year 2023. This includes Carson City, Douglas, Elko, Esmeralda, Eureka, Humboldt, Lincoln, Pershing and Story counties. It further clarifies that these school districts may reapportion base and weight funding to provide a reasonably equal educational opportunity for its pupils. Moving on to section seven, subsection one of section seven provides general fund appropriations of $224.7 million in fiscal year 2022 and $230.3 million in fiscal year 2023 for the account for state special education services. This reflects the state funding provided to school districts and charter schools that includes the state maintenance of effort related to special education funding. Subsection two, provides authorizations of $2 million in each year of the 2021-23 biennium in the account for state special education services. This is balance forward uh, amount utilized to fund the extraordinary special education expenditures. 
subsection three and four provides the transfer of $223.2 million in fiscal year 2022 and $228.8 million in fiscal year 23 for state special education funding provided to school districts and charter schools, largely based on their special education enrollment as a multiplier. As a reminder, state special education funding is limited to no more than 13% of total enrollment for each school district and charter school. Subsection five and six provides the transfer of $1.5 million in each year of the 2021-23 biennium for state special education funding provided to school districts and charter schools with special education enrollment that exceeds the 13% funding and cap. Subsection seven and eight provides the transfer of $2 million that is utilized to fund extraordinary special education expenditures that are not ordinarily present in the typical special education service and delivery system at a public school. Subsection nine provides the reversion of funding at the end of each fiscal year. Uh, Madam Chair, Julie Waller for the record, and I'll walk you through uh, the next few sections. Uh, section 8 on the bottom of page 19 is an appropriation for the other state education programs account of $37.4 million in both fiscal year 22 and 23. Moving on to page 20. Uh, subsection 3 of Section 8 authorizes $252,098 in fiscal year 23. Uh, from money not appropriated from the general fund related to the one-time match for requirement for the job for America's graduate program. Subsection four of section eight transfers $19.3 million for both fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 from the other state education programs for the adult high school diploma program. Subsection five of section eight includes an annual reporting requirement for this program. <clears throat> Moving on to page 21, subsection seven of section eight provides that money appropriated outlined in this section is available for both fiscal year 22 and 2023 and may be transferred from year to year with the interim finance committee approval. Paragraph A transfers a total of $3.9 million in fiscal year 22 and also 2023 for the Job for America's Graduates program. And as well, uh, transfer or authorizes expenditure of up of an amount up to $252,098 in each fiscal year, contingent upon matching money being provided from sources other than the appropriation in subsection one. Paragraph B transfers a total of $300,000 in both fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 to the De Department of Education for transfer to the Clark County Public Education Foundation for the implementation and operation of education leadership training programs. Expenditures of these amounts is, is contingent upon a one-to-one -one match from sources other than the state uh, uh, appropriation. On page 22, subsection eight uh, includes an annual reporting requirement to the Interim Finance Committee for the Education Leadership Training Program. Moving on to page 23, Subsection 10 of Section 8 transfers $13.5 million in both fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 from the other state education programs account for the award of grants for career and technical education programs. Subsection 12 of Section 8 transfers $462,725 in both fiscal year 22 and 2023 from the other state education programs account for the award of grants to support public broadcasting in the state. Next. Madam Chair, for the record, Jay Marie Mangoba, and I'll be walking you through um, sections nine to 19. So starting on page 23, section nine, um, this section provides general fund appropriations of 7.3 million in each year of the 2021-23 biennium to the professional development programs account to su support the three regional professional training programs and the teacher of the year program. Moving on to page 24, section 10 just provides the breakdown of the funding that will be provided to each of this uh, regional professional development program. Moving on to section 11, 
Um, this provides funding of $100,000 each year to the statewide council for the coordination of the regional training programs for additional training opportunities for educational administrators in Nevada. And I would note section 12 is a parallel language that transfers the responsibilities of the statewide council for coordination of the regional training programs to the Department of Education if Senate Bill 76 of this uh, legislative session, which abolishes this council, is enacted by the legislature and approved by the governor. On page 27, section 13, as indicated earlier, um, this provides uh, funding of $8,095 in each year for the Teacher of the Year program. Section 14 provides general fund appropriations of $459,849 in each year for the one-fifth retirement credit purchase program account to purchase one-fifth of a year of retirement service credit. Moving on to section 15 on page 28, this provides general fund appropriations of 2.4 million in each year to the Teach Nevada Scholarship account. And subsection three of section 15 provides the authorization of $4 million in fiscal year 22 and 4.1 million in fiscal year 23 for the Teach Nevada Scholarship Program. Section 16 is a transitory language that clarifies that net proceeds and minerals are revenue source in the state education fund and recognizes that net proceeds and minerals collected by local counties in fiscal year 21 are included as revenue source in the state education fund in fiscal year 22. Section 17 on page 29 requires any balance in the account for programs for innovation and prevention of remediation, the teacher school supplies assistance accounts, and the account for the new Nevada education funding plan at the end of fiscal year 21 to be reverted to the state education fund. Section 18 revises the hold harmless provision related to the student enrollment. Since the fiscal year 21 may be skewed due to the pandemic, this section allows the department to use enrollment count from fiscal year 20 or fiscal year 21, whichever is higher for the purposes of making the monthly apportionments from the state education fund to school districts and charter schools if the average enrollment of pupils during that quarter is less than or equal to 95% of the enrollment of pupils in the same school or charter schools. This provision do not apply to any decrease in enrollment of pupils in a charter school that's caused by an action of a sponsor of that charter school. And just for example, if the sponsor closes an elementary school for poor performance, this would not apply to them. Section 19 appropriates $50 million from the state general fund to the state education stabilization account as a loan to the account to provide seed money to fund any future transfers from the state education fund to school districts and charter schools. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Again, for the record, Adam Dross with LCB Fiscal. Moving on to section 20, which can be found on page 30 of your uh, BDR. Section 20 modifies NRS 387-121 to reflect legislative intent that charter schools and university schools should be included in a calculation of hold harmless under the pupil-centered funding plan. It also clarifies that hold harmless is calculated on a per pupil basis based on a reasonably similar level of funding provided in FY 2020. It also clarifies that all charter schools should be considered as a whole rather than individually when determining if charter schools would be eligible for the hold harmless provisions under the pupil-centered funding plan. Moving on to section 21 on page 32, this modifies NRS 387-122 by eliminating the references to the distributive school account. And subsection one also clarifies the additional support for special education that would be provided as a multiplier under the pupil-centered funding plan, while also considering the federal maintenance of effort requirements when distributing this funding. Subsection two clarifies the additional support for special education that would be provided as a multiplier under the pupil-centered funding plan for those school districts and charter schools that have special education enrollment that exceeds the 13% cap of their total enrollment. 
Finally, subsection two eliminates the references to the former equity allocation model that was used by the former Nevada Plan Formula Fund. Moving on to section 22, that can be found on page 35. Subsection 10 of section 22 clarifies the commission on school funding may meet between July 1st of odd numbered years and September 30th of the subsequent even numbered years. And this is consistent with the closing action of the money committees and the travel funding approved for the commission. Section 23, that can be found on page 37, allows transportation funding for Native American students who attend school outside of their school district to be provided to the school district of residence by the school district where the student is enrolled. I would note this funding is provided through the pupil-centered funding plan through the transportation tier funding. Section 24 restores NRS 387-122, which was discussed in section 21, and clarifies the additional support for special ed education that would be provided as a multiplier under the people-centered funding plan, while also considering the federal maintenance of effort requirements when distributing this funding. Section 25 on page 38 revises NRS 387-1214 which was amended this session by SB 439 to reflect additional tier funding for local special education funding. And this is reflected in subsection 2B. Subsection three and four also clarifies the attendance area adjustment and provides for this adjustment for charter schools and university schools as applicable. Section 26, provides an attendance area adjustment for charter schools. It also clarifies a charter school receives the same attendance area adjustment on a per pupil basis that a public school within a school district at the same location would receive. Thank you, Madam Chair. Julie Waller for the record. Um, section 27. Um, Sections 27 to 30, uh, in, including section 33, amend SB 439 to make conforming changes for the addition of local money for special education as a separate tier. Moving on to page 52. Uh, Section 31 also requires local funding for students with disabilities provided through a separate tier to be counted for separately. And moving on to page 57. Section 32 revises NRS 387.12463 which was amended in SB 439 this session to replace the district equity adjustment with the attendance area cost adjustment. And then section 33, uh, we addressed section 33 already as conforming language. And then the last section of the bill is uh, sections one through three of section 34, provide the effective dates of various sections of the bill, uh, particularly uh, section uh, 34 and section 19 become effective upon passage and approval. And this is to create the state education fund and the education stabilization account in order to um, receive the uh, uh, general fund appropriation of $50 million that will be loaned to uh, seed as seed funding for the education stabilization account. And subsections four and five provide the parallel language related to funding for the statewide council for the coordination of regional training programs. If section 76 uh, were to be approved, uh, approved and uh, signed by the governor. With that, Madam Chair, we're happy to um, address any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much. That was an excellent walkthrough of a very complicated bill with all the changes that have been worked on over the last year or so. This is a huge sea change for us. So with that, committee members, I'm going to open it up for questions or comments at this time. There's a lot of information there. So does anyone have a question at this time? 
Assemblywoman Tolls. I think your section is number 20, but I'm going to let Mr. Drost or whoever confirm that. Uh, Assemblywoman Tolls is interested in that charter school language she wanted to make sure was incorporated with all the um, conversations that we had had. So, Assemblywoman, did you want to specify? Thank you so much, Chair, and I think you did a good job summarizing for me, but uh, we had a lengthy discussion about what happens to charter schools since they operate a little bit differently than the school districts by county. Um, we had talked about lumping all the money together um, by the county as opposed to by the whole state since they don't move money around the same way, and I believe that I see this covered. Um, actually, I see referenced numerous times in here but let's just go with uh, the chair because she's very astute on these things and look at section 20, that's page 31, where it talks about um, maybe that regional factor um, with the reasonably similar level of funding uh, that the district, charter school or university uh, school for profoundly gifted principal pupils um, will receive. So could we just confirm and walk through that in reference to the discussion we had last week. Anyone? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Adam Dross with LCB Fiscal Analysis Division, uh, Assemblywoman Tolls. Uh, I would note that, yes, Section 20 uh, provides, uh, clarifies that included or includes charter schools and university schools for profoundly gifted in the calculation of hold harmless. For the people centered funding plan. I would also note uh, that section 26 provides that attendance area adjustment for charter schools and that charter schools would receive the same attendance area adjustment on a per pupil basis that a public school within a school district at the same location would receive. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so thank you. So I, I, th I think we're speaking the same language that we're not lumping them all together for, for the whole state. We're, we're doing it similarly within that, that same county. That's what I heard and, um, and I see you nodding. So uh, that's, that's wonderful. What, um, okay. Um, so if we were ever in a situation where um, even within that district, let's say we have a, a school that might be losing like more than 10% of, of what their um, currently budgeting at, this would keep that from happening or um, or would there ever be a situation where we would see a school um, losing uh, more than let's say 10% uh, from from where they are even within that regional calculation today? Uh, Assemblywoman Tolls, uh, just to clarify, the lumping of charter schools together, that is an initial calculation to determine if they would be placed on hold harmless or the people-centered funding plan. So I, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, I think your question is if their funding would be reduced by 10%, is that correct? Just, yeah, just throwing out a hypothetical. Do we have any situations where we see um, any charters that they are going to be held harmless at the same level? We're not going to see any that are going to drop lower. All, all charters would be under the pupil center funding plan uh, in, in the 2021, 2023 biennium. Okay. So they would not be under the hold harmless. They would all be included in the pupil center funding plan. Um, absent any kind of enrollment drop and the protections provided in NRS or the two-year look-back period that uh, Ms. Mangoba mentioned earlier to address any decreases in enrollment beyond the 5%. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that clarity. And if I could ask one more just overarching question as a follow-up from last week. Um, so as we look at this overall new estimated average of our base peer pupil funding, do we have an estimate of where that would put us in our national rankings um, today? We have not had time to, to make any sort of calculation or determination. I apologize. Okay, thank you. I, I think we would all still love to see that when you do, but I understand how busy you've been, and we appreciate all that work you've put into this, truly. Okay. And I would note, too, Assemblywoman Tolls, that's often based upon actual uh, revenue and expenditures, so it may 
you know, take time to kind of have those uh, analysis done on a national level. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Titus is next. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to all the staff involved with this, uh, Yeoman's work, and I thank you for all your long hours and, and the work that you've put on. I have some specific, specific questions regarding um, this BDR, and I'll start with, if I might, Madam Chair, page 18. And on page 18, um, it, and number five, in regards to the Department of Education shall transfer from the account for special ed um, based on the NRS, the, the um, 1,500,000 uh, and the two separate fiscal years. Um, and is that to be distributed um, equally among the schools? Do the school districts have to apply for that? Can you explain what that transfer, uh, how that transfer works? Certainly, uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman so, uh, Titus. The $1.5 million is provided as additional funding for those school districts that exceed the 13% funding cap based on their enrollment or in their count of special education pupils. Um, the department has a uh, calculation they, they go through to determine that amount, and it's, it generally provides one half of the multiplier or a uh, reasonably uh, similar amount. Uh, and there is no application process. It is a formulaic uh, process by the department. And do we know how many, if I might follow up, Madam Chair, along the same line, how many school districts then would fall into that category? Or are they yet to be determined? Um, I can give you the current amount if you give me a minute here. Um, Dr. Titus, it appears there are only two districts that are below the 13 percent. I'm sorry, three districts, as well as the charter uh, charter schools. So three dif continue, Madam Chair. So three districts would be able to get that, or w without asking, they'd automatically get that money, correct? Those three districts would not, because they would, would not. be under okay. the 13 percent. Then, to, for clarity, then it says it shall, so that's a must to transfer that money to those districts. Then, I can you clarify then on number seven where it says they may transfer that money for special education purposes? It seems like it's the same use, but one is a mandate shall and the other is may. Do we know what the trigger is for that may? Um, Dr. Titus, I would note that subsection seven is related to extraordinary expenditures associated with um, special education delivery. So these would be um, some high cost, extraordinary expenditures that districts would, would have. Um, this is, is through an application process um, that districts apply for. Uh, so I believe that is why that uh, language includes May. Great, and thank you. So just for clarity, so that would cover those those special uh, situations, special needs children, um, just so school districts, if they had that uh, um, unique child or so, or several of them, then they could apply for this additional uh, resource? That is correct. As an example, uh, there may be a small rural district that has a deaf student. They want to transport that student to a, a neighboring district. This would provide funding for those transportation costs. And last question, if I might, Madam Chair, along the disabilities question. On page 53, it says, each public school shall account separately for the local funding for pupils with disabilities. Could you clarify that? That's kind of an in, in italics and I just in a special writing. Could you explain, so each school, not just the district, um, would then be able to apply for a special, um, how does that work with the, it talks about, you know, the disabilities received by public school pursuant to the same NRS chapter, 
Um, and I'm just wondering if that's a different set of funding or is it the same set of funding? Thank you. So this is the local funding that's provided as a tier funding in the people-centered funding plan. And this just requires uh, the uh, schools to, re uh, to record that separately. And I believe the school language may be because there are charter schools that are included in that. But still, for, I'm sorry, but still for disability, children with disabilities. Yes, it may be used to satisfy that there, the local uh, students with disabilities needs. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, for all the questions. You're welcome. So with that, uh, are there members' questions at this time? Um, Senator Gokachia. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm going kind of back to a basic. I'm trying to understand uh, on page 15, uh, sub 6, uh, why the there seems to be a real significant difference, say, between Churchill and White Pine uh, when we're talking $2,500. I'm trying to figure out why that would be so so big. The rest of them seem to be pretty well grouped there, and then all of a sudden we go from 8,000 to over 10. Uh, can you distance factor, or I mean, what's weighting that? Senator Gokachia, that includes the adjustment factor uh, for the attendance area, and the way that is calculated, it's using the same per pupil amount that is provided for the public school at the school district that operates in the same location as the charter school. So uh, White Pine is rather high because it, uh, White Pine operating in Ely has a higher per pupil adjustment and that is reflected for the charter school that also operates in that same location. If, I'm, if I may, Madam Chair, follow up. Uh, I guess I'm, uh, again, uh, like I say, we've got a $2,000 difference between White Pine and Elko. I'm sure it's just the way the numbers fell out, but. Uh, it kind of intriguing. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Other questions from other committee members at this time? Uh, Senator Kikover. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Um, clarification on a couple of sections. Section 18, um, does this sort of refer back to the old um, hold harmless provision to protect against student population drops? There was some COVID reference in there when Ms. Dagday was, I'm sorry, Ms. Mangoba was presenting it. Sorry. Um, you're correct, Senator. This is um, the hold harmless provision if their enrollment drop to 95% um, or less. Um, but the change that was made in here is to, instead of just using the previous fiscal year, which is fiscal year 21, this section would allow them to use fiscal year 20 or fiscal year 21, whichever is higher. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, so I don't, I'm, I'm trying to remember if we had that discussion, did we? <laughs> and I'll hop in, I wouldn't ask staff to do that, but we did have a couple of discussions in the subcommittee on education about making sure that there wasn't any unintended consequences because of the way the school districts operated and the kids went to school during that pandemic year. And we wanted to give them the opportunity to be able to work with the year that would get them at the level that they needed to be. Because remember, we're starting a base here and we didn't want to artificially penalize them because of the way the pandemic impacted the school year and enrollment in some cases. So that was a, a topic of discussion that we had in in a couple of the meetings. Yeah, I, I I I remember the topic coming up. I don't remember a decision point on it, and um, I'll have to go back and check. So okay. I appreciate that. My second um, question was related to um, I'm sorry on page 37 of our draft when it relates to the commission on school funding. Um, I also recall our conversations on this front circling around. Um, an appropriation sufficient to support a number of meetings, um, but I don't, I don't recall us discussing whether we were going to prohibit them from meeting following September 30th of a, of an even numbered year. I mean, if there was a, um, if there was a need for them to meet to clarify something before the legislature comes into session, I would ask, comes into session. I would hate to preclude them from throwing together a quick Zoom meeting. 
um, by the language that we see here in subsection 10 of section 22. On page 37 of the uh, BDR. And that was part of the budget closing differences that we discussed that one Saturday morning. I think it was a Saturday morning. Yeah. But um, Ms. Kaufman or any of the folks on the uh, education team, I know there was a lot of conversation from the majority leader on this item. So if anyone wants to provide some clarification for the senator. Madam Chair, this is uh, Sarah Kaufman, Legislative Council Bureau. I believe this got, the, the discussion um, was around uh, having uh, this commission also act similarly to the other interim commissions. And so I believe that was the discussion point. Senator? Yeah. I th you know, I remember some framing in that, in, that, in that point, so I appreciate that, Ms. Kaufman. I just, I would hate to think that if we, if we wanted the input of the experts, that they would be precluded from meeting by um, the language that we put in the bill. Um, our discussion was really around how many meetings we were going to fund them for, but if they um, were able to have um, some additional ones with the funding that gets provided because they decide to do a couple extras virtual versus in person or something to that effect, um, I just I think that restriction may be um, more than more than we asked for, but maybe it's totally comfortable for the body. And it's my recollection that that was all part of that budget closing differences, but I'll be corrected by staff because there was so many different conversations about this but the indication was that they were going to operate along the same lines as the other committees so that they could get their work to the legislature so that we could go ahead and working start working on things so that was part of that conversation to my recollection Ms. Kaufman Madam Chair yes I believe that is correct Other questions from other committee members? Uh, Senator Severs Ganser. Thank, thank you, Chair Carlton. So I want to circle back to the charters again because we talked about the hold harmless. My understanding was they were grouped together to decide whether they're going to have hold harmless or not, and then they're broken apart basically for the small area adjustment. But it's my understanding that some of the charters in the rurals, when you when you put them all together and made that decision individually as schools they still aren't hold, held harmless. So the units are held harmless, but not in certain school or d like district areas or where they fall. And I'm not quite sure if we ever talked about that or how that exactly happened. So if we had a school that was getting $8,000 per student um, per year originally, and it was, were going to be held harmless, we thought they were starting at that point, not a lower point. And it sounds like some of them were starting at a lower point because of the, the way that they were grouped for that decision. So I don't, I'm not sure if there was a Yeah, oh, go, go ahead. Me. Yeah. Um, in response, uh, Senator Severs answered, uh, I would note that yes, they are grouped together to make that initial determination about hold harmless and whether they would be under the pupil-centered funding plan or the hold harmless provisions. However, um, the money committees did determine that the size adjustment would be provided for those districts. And that largely uh, did benefit those uh, rural charter schools, um, as indicated on page eight and noted earlier by Senator Gokachia, uh, that increased the funding uh, for those uh, rural charter schools based on their size adjustment factor. That's what I thought. I mean, I thought they were all gonna be up a little bit because the size adjustment factor, but, but I'm, I'm being told that they're not, that some of them are below what they used to be, even with that size adjustment factor, and I'm not quite sure how that happened. And I wanted to make sure that they were at least the level they were, um, even with the size adjustment factor, that they at least were held harmless individually in, in those counties. So maybe, maybe we could take that offline and we can get an explanation of how, how that happened, or if, if maybe there's the calculations off somehow. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Uh, Senator Severs Gansert, I would just note um, that yes, they are considered as a whole, as a group for the hold harmless provision. 
Um, for the size adjustment factor, it does consider the size adjustment factor that is provided for public schools in that same area for that operate in, within a school district. So for the greater Reno Sparks area and the greater Las Vegas area, there is no size adjustment applied for those public schools within the school district. So therefore there's no size adjustment applied for those charter schools in that same area. Um, thank you. And that part makes sense to me, but I guess there's there's potentially a charter school in Elko that's getting less than they received before. And I thought no matter what, they were going to be in a little bit of a plus up, either even or a plus up situation. So there's not, not necessarily since, it, you know, as a group, they're being considered for hold harmless and then at an individual level for, under the people centered funding plan. The new plan, no hold harmless. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the, the all charter schools moved under the pupil centered funding plan and off of home harmless. Okay, thank you. Other questions from other committees, uh, committee members at this time? Um, hold on for just a moment. So I think I need to clarify a couple of things. I'm going to go back to, to Senator Kickheffer's point with the, the time frames on that, Ms. Kaufman. So there, there seems to be some, some confusion on the commission and the ending date. So and we discussed it so many different times, it's hard to remember each iteration of how it changed. So in the final budget closing differences when we had the two separate differences and the Senate went with the assembly on that one. The date that is listed here ending in September trued up with all the other committees on how they work. Is, is that how it was specifically laid out or was that an, um, an iteration of that? Madam Chair, that is correct. So the the travel expenditures that were provided, uh, provided for the commission to have uh, travel available for the full fiscal year in 2022. Uh, however, there was a combination of both virtual meetings as well as in-person meetings that were provided in 2022. And then there was also um, travel expenditures that were provided for the first three months of 2023. And in there, we had indicated in, in our documentation that it would be through September 30th, uh, 2022. And so um, the discussion related around the um, similar, uh, uh, the, the ability to um, make this very similar to how other interim um, committees uh, are operated. And so that is uh, why this, this language was provided for in here, um, because it was, and I, I believe it may have been an assumption on, on staff's part, but it was our assumption then that because the travel was um, limited to September 30th and there was the discussion to make this similar to how other commissions are, um, are handled, that this would then provide a limit. And thank you, Ms. Kaufman. I'm going to go to Senator Brooks. Senator had pulled up the um, final budget closing differences document, and it does del it does uh, enunciate that date. So, Senator, if you would um, just clarify this, because I wanted to make sure that I was remembering the right thing too, because there was a lot going on at that time. Yeah, when we go back to our um, our report on budget closing differences, and and this particular difference that we discussed. Um, I'll read it uh, word for word here. It says, the Assembly Committee on Ways and Means approved general fund appropriations of 15,000 in fiscal year 2022 and 5,000 in fiscal year 2023, which would provide two day monthly in-person meetings every other month or six in-person meetings and six virtual meetings in fiscal year 2022 and two two day in-person meetings and one virtual meeting through September 30th, 2022 in FY 2023 for the Commission on School Funding. Uh, the uh, Assembly Committee on Ways and Means further approved general fund appropriations of $7,745 in FY 2022, $5,595 in FY 2023. And that was the motion that we ended up taking collectively. 
Thank you, Senator. And I just want to make sure we had a really clear record because Senator Kickheffer brought up a good question, and I just wanted to make sure that we all remembered it and we were all on the same page. So that is the motion that we did vote on, and that's why it is in the bill. Yes, Senator Kickheffer, of course. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Um, so you know, we appropriate them X number of dollars, right? And we, we say we're, we're funding it um, based on X, which is these numbers of meetings that we came up with. If they don't spend all of those funds, are they... I would not have interpreted our motion to, um, in, in, in that in that meeting to say that they would then n not be able to meet. Um, I would say we're funding them to this level. If they're more efficient, perhaps they could throw another meeting in. Um, if they're if they decide to have um, more virtual meetings than in-person meetings, um, that they could continue to meet. Um, I mean, generally, when we appropriate. Um, money into categories, the agency then manages those funds throughout the course of the year um, to the level that um, that they deem appropriate. So I just, I guess I never interpreted that we would say, okay, you're, you're shut off after um, after September 30th. Um, and I, I just think we may find value of having them at our disposal if we ask them for some expert opinion on some dumb stuff as we move into the next legislative session. Maybe I'm harping on something that isn't a big deal. Um, it, it, it was just language that was surprising to me. Thank you. And I, I appreciate your concern, Senator Kikeffer, but we are on the clock, and this needs to get done tonight so that we can stay on track. I believe if, if it was a more significant issue, we could have further conversations, but at this moment in time, I don't believe this is the issue that should cause the train to jump the track at this time. Okay. Future conversations for future legislators. Senator Dennis. Just a quick question for staff. So if we did need them to meet, I mean, what would be the process for that? I mean, if like during session we needed them to, to review something for us, is there a process for that? Or is it, I'm not saying we need to set it something up, but I just want to know if there is anything for that. Uh, Madam Chair, I believe in section uh, 22, subsection 10, uh, it indicates that the commission may only meet between uh, July 1st of odd number of years and September 30th of subsequent even number of years. Okay. I, yeah, I think definitely you should look at that because when we designed this, we didn't design it to be treated like um, a interim commission. It was something that would just meet all the time to be able to look at the trends and what's happening with the changes in, in funding for education and those kind of things. So that's yeah, something you may want to look at in the future. Thank you, Senator Dennis. Other questions or comments from other committee members at this time? Seeing no other comments, my co-chair just went out the back door. So I this is not a bill hearing, so we will not be bringing up support, opposition, and neutral. This is the review of a draft of a BDR, which will be introduced in the Senate after this committee adjourns, and it will make its way through the process that way. So I'm going to hold for just a second. And we'll be right back. Hold on for just a moment.
So, uh, committee members, are there any other questions of Mr. Thorley, Ms. Kaufman, or our most awesome education team on the West Coast? Not seeing any. So, Ms. Kaufman, our next steps. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the next steps would be to um, adjourn the full committee, and at that point in time, the Senate uh, Committee on Finance will come together, um, and they will introduce the BDR. Um, it will then be reassigned back to them um, in order for them to have a hearing. Okay. Thank you very much. So if there's a, a moment in time where someone has something that they need to, dis to discuss, this is the time, because... When this BDR gets introduced and moved, we typically do not amend the K-12 education bill. This is what you see before you is what will be the pupil-centered funding plan and education funding for the next two years in the state of Nevada. So, uh, Assemblywoman Miller, did you have a question? Thank you, Chair. Uh, that being said, my question is, I heard during the presentation there was a mention of, basically this section is contingent upon certain bills passing. And so I was just wondering what happens with the, those allocated funds if those bills weren't to pass? I, yes. Okay. Madam Chair, I believe you're, you're referring to sections 11 and 12? Yes. Uh, so there, there's parallel language for sections 11 and 12. If uh, one instance occurs, then one section would, would take their place. And if another, um, if, if it doesn't happen, then the, section 12 takes over. So there are parallel, language, or parallel languages in the event either situation occurs. Okay, great. Thank you. Good question. So, not seeing any other questions from any other committee members at this time. You've been walked through the K-12 funding model, the pupil-centered funding model, and I would be very remiss if I know Senator Woodhouse is watching this right now. Senator Woodhouse, thank you for all of your hard work. This is what you've been working for for a very long time. So congratulations on everything that you have done um, in your passion for pupil-centered funding. So I just wanted to congratulate you on the record as this committee completes its work. So with that, committee members, I don't think there's anything else before us. But we probably should take public comment. That might be a good thing. So with that, is there public comment to come before the committee this evening? Mr. Daly. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Chris Daly, Nevada State Education uh, Association. Uh, you know, you, you've heard uh, NSCA and you've heard me talk uh, a good bit about Zoom and Victory Schools over the course of this session and uh, over the last two years. And I think, uh, you know, what we've uh, seen in this budget, uh, although there is a whole lot of good, um, there's also uh, a particular problem uh, which I think is the reason why we've been talking about this, and that's uh, the the weight uh, for at-risk uh, pupils for both uh, next fiscal year and the out fiscal year at, at being 0 0.03. I think that's one-tenth of uh, the targeted weight, and if you multiply the 0 0.03 out uh, by the base funding, that's about $209 per pupil. And if you uh, harken back to... Uh, two years ago in passing 543 and moving Victory Schools, which, by the way, uh, a, a model program of education equity necessarily located in Nevada's poorest zip codes, uh, serving the highest needs students, uh, those programs are, are basically watered down, and that funding that went to Victory uh, and Zoom gets distributed through the weights. Uh, and the Victory services that schools are to provide in lieu of the Victory Schools, these Victory Services, uh, there's a menu of options, and Senator Dennis knows this. Uh, one, a pre-kindergarten program, a summer academy, uh, additional instruction for other learning opportunities, uh, professional development for teachers uh, and other education uh, personnel, uh, incentives for hiring and retaining teachers or other licensed education personnel, employment of additional paraprofessionals, 
uh, or other education uh, personnel, uh, that you can do a reading uh, skills center, uh, uh, or integrated student supports, wraparound services, and evidence-based evidence programs designed to meet the needs of at-risk pupils. These are the menu of services that uh, Victory Schools provide. Uh, and when taken together, they transform those schools, uh, that school climate and culture, and that school community. Uh, what out of this menu uh, are we going to be able to provide at-risk students with $209 uh, in incremental funding per pupil per year? Um, you know, that, I think, is the tough pill to swallow. There's a lot of uh, other stuff in here. Uh, that's very good, but in terms of moving towards greater equity, uh, I think this needs to be a focus moving forward uh, and maybe uh, a place where additional funds uh, can go uh, as we work to find them. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to make public comment at this time? Please consider the two-minute limit. Kent Irvin, Nevada Faculty Alliance. Good evening, Chair Carlton, Chair Brooks, and committee members. Thank you for your hard work on the K-12 budget. I have two other end of session issues to bring to your attention. First, as we have previously testified, it is too late to restore PEB benefits for state employees for FY22, but you can still restore PEB benefits for FY2023 by appropriating state funds or by authorizing federal funds to raise the employer contribution in SB 451, the PEB, PEB funding bill, back to pre-pandemic levels. Second, the executive department has agreed to cost of living adjustments, COLAs, for up, of up to 3% in FY 2023 for state classified collective bargaining units. We request, request that you extend COLAs to all state employees, including classified employees in the bargaining units under NRS 288 that have not yet organized, and the NSHE professional employees who do not yet have collective bargaining and statute pending passage of SB 373. The last state COLA was in July 2019, and since then the consumer price index has increased 4.6%. State employees are currently taking 4.6 pay cuts in furloughs. Housing costs are skyrocketing. And over the past 10 years, state COLAs have trailed inflation 22% to 12% for a 10% net loss in purchasing power. State employees have worked through the pandemic under difficult circumstances. We are grateful that there were no mass layoffs but positions held vacant and furloughs have increased workloads and we have suffered through the furlough pay cuts. 45% higher PEB healthcare premiums and greatly reduced benefits. 25 million was saved from PEB in FY 2021 th through the employer premium holiday and the special session and another 25 to 30 million was saved by furloughs. Now that additional state, now that additional state fund and federal funds are available, it is time to pay back your state employees by fully restoring com compensation and benefits. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. There's two seats at the table, so if you're gonna make public comment, come <clears throat> on down. Good evening, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Adler. Uh, representing the Charter School Association of Nevada. We greatly appreciate your collective work in recognizing charter schools in the formula in Section 5 of SB uh, 439 and the work on Hold Harmless. Nonetheless, we are concerned that there are still individual schools that may not be held harmless when this formula is applied. Uh, we appreciate the work to lump and then disaggregate, uh, but we want to register that concern. It was always the understanding that no pupil, no student would be harmed as this transition occurred. So we want to put uh, that concern on the record. Uh, in addition, uh, when you look at uh, the numbers on page 13 versus the numbers on page 15, I understand one is district and one is the exact attendance area the charter schools sit in, but in some cases those are $3,000 differences within the same county. So we're, we're appreciative 
and we still have a few questions, uh, particularly about rural schools. Thank you so much. Anyone else wishing to make public comment this evening? Not seeing anyone. I believe our mission for today is accomplished. The joint, oh, I'm sorry, Zoom and phone. Always forget about it. I don't think there's anyone on Zoom, but we can go to the audio line. Is there anyone on the audio line wishing to make public comment this evening? Thank you for reminding me. If you would like to, pardon me. If you would like to make public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 853. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Doug Unger, D-O-U-G-U-N-G-E-R, uh, UNLV Chapter President and Southern Government Affairs Representative, Nevada Faculty Alliance. Thank you, Chair Carlton and Chair Brooks and members of the committee for this work on K through 12 funding. Um, and uh, I would also like to echo the thanks to Senator Woodhouse for the per pupil funding formula that she worked on for most of her career. Um, I would like to echo uh, what Kent Irvin uh, uh, testified to in public comment that, that Nevada State employees are very concerned with PEB benefits and possible COLA for this session if it's at all possible to do. The full restoration of PEB benefits we think is really warranted. We've worked very hard through the pandemic. Um, we're in open enrollment right now and my email has lit up with state employees, faculty members who are looking at their health benefits and only realizing now the tremendous cuts that are being inflicted on them on the plan for 21-22. 44% higher premiums, 17% higher deductibles, 28% higher out-of-pocket maximums, and 45% lower HSA contributions. Particularly those members with families are feeling this, and also the plan designs that shift costs to the sickest and most vulnerable. It would only cost $30 million to restore PEB plans back to 2019 levels for the 23 fiscal year. We hope that you will do this and hope that you will consider other me measures to help our state employees catch up and to recover from the pandemic. Thank you so much for your work during this most unusual and very rushed legislative session and hope you all have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the phone line, please? Chair Carlson, that is our only caller on the public comment line. Thank you very much, and thank you, committee, for catching me before I made that mistake. So with that, I believe now the Assembly Ways and Means and Senate Finance Committee can adjourn 12 hours after we started. We're adjourned. <laughs>